Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, welcome back to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. This is Tim Fisher from Purdue and we're in week three, uh, which in which we're covering basic thermal properties, and today we're going to talk about thermal conductivity almost for the first time. We sort of hinted at thermal conductivity and conductance way back at the beginning of the course, and so far this week we've talked about heat capacity of the three of three different types of carriers: acoustic phonons, optical phonons, and electrons. And today we're going to take it one step further with thermal conductivity, although we're going to do it from a, a fairly basic and approximate level for now, and then once we get into some later weeks in the course, we'll, we'll add some uh, further details to it. So with kinetic theory, uh, we, when we have many scattering events as, as a carrier transports through a system, all sorts of things can happen and they can be very, very complicated. And so uh, to, to simplify that, what we're going to do is average over these scattering events. We're not going to talk too much this week about the types of scattering events that might be and, and how they might depend on things like energy or direction. Uh, but kinetic theory is something, it, it really was derived for uh, gas phase analysis, um, lends itself well to this problem. Um, and one of the key things in this in this theory is that is the something called the scattering rate. Mean free path is sometimes used, um, and sometimes scattering length. Um, I actually prefer to call it the scattering length, but uh, but mean free path does imply a little bit more uh, about what it is. It's the average distance that a carrier travels between collisions, and so. This kinetic theory is strictly applicable to what we would call particle transport problems. And so it, we can approximate the effects of scattering uh, on many kinds of carriers. What it cannot do, however, is that when there are wave-like effects, so that would be interference and tunneling and diffraction, um, when those effects are important to the transport problem, then this, this uh, kinetic theory really does not apply. But for, for Many, many problems that we're interested in, even with small scale objects, uh, the particle view uh, is fine and, and gives us reasonable answers. And we're going to use a relaxation time approximation. Uh, often we, this is abbreviated as RTA. Um, so for example, in the Debye approximation, we have this, this group velocity uh, for all of the, the acoustic branches and where we have an average uh, group velocity, and so the relaxation time, the group velocity, and the mean free path or the scattering length are all interrelated. So we'll talk here about the mean free path, and we're going to go back to some of the things that we discussed earlier in the week, uh, specifically the uh, specific internal energy, U, so that's lowercase u, and we're going to assume that this energy density, I'll call it, is a function of position. That means that in one part of the material, the energy density is different than in another. And we're only going to focus our attention in one dimension, at least in terms of this, this energy density gradient, or energy uh, specific energy gradient. And we're going to look at what happens as carriers move through this space and how they might collide, how they carry that energy, and then ultimately we're going to derive something called thermal conductivity from that. So if we broke up the problem into a series of zones, and let's say that I'm, I want to pay attention first to this, uh, to this middle plane Z, then above and below the plane Z I'll, I'll put uh, two different planes at Z plus lambda sub Z, that's the Z component of the mean free path, and minus lambda Z. And I'm interested here to calculate with, you know, again, given this energy density field uh, that depends only on Z, I'm interested in how fast heat flows through in this dimension Z. And we'll say that how fast it flows per unit area, so that's the heat flux. Okay, and we'll call that Q double prime with a subscript Z to denote the direction that it's flowing. So heat flux is a uh, an important consideration in all of this and so we're going to actually now try to relate the heat flux to this internal energy density um, and its and its gradient so what we'll say here and, and this 
equation may not be quite so intuitive or quite so obvious, but if we if we imagine it this way, I think it helps. So the the energy density is in uh, is in something like joules uh, units of joules per unit volume in three dimensions. So that would be um, joules per meter cubed, for example. And so this this a particle will have that energy density at a given position, and it's moving with a velocity v. So if I multiply the energy density and the velocity, the units I get at least will be joules per second per meter squared. So that gives me, and another way of saying that is watts per meter squared. So that gives me an energy flux, okay? Now I can't just take that and say, you know, velocity times internal energy density is, you know, that product is gonna give me a heat flux because in this thermal energy field, the carriers are moving all over the place and so they'll be moving not just in one direction, like for example from down to up, they'll also be moving up to down. And so I have to kind of take a balance of those two, uh, two directions. And so what we have is uh, a, a, a difference equation where we're going to take the difference between the internal energy density at those two planes, above and below the z-plane, separated from the z-plane by the distance of the mean free path in the z direction, uh, plus and minus. Uh, we'll take the difference of those, multiply by the velocity, and then uh, one half term because only half of the particles are moving in, in the direction of interest. Okay, So in the bottom plane we're interested in, in the particles that are moving up, and in the top plane we're interested in the particles that are moving down, and so each of those has a one half term associated with it. Now this seems really simple so far, and, and really it is, but we've done one thing consistently so far that to simplify it, and that is to only take the z components of, of these um, different factors. Now, we really are only interested in, in this case, in the z component of the heat flux, but the velocity of carriers can be moving in all three dimensions, and, uh, and the mean free path is not necessarily uh, or the z component of the mean, mean free path will be uh, will will have to be dealt with in terms of the directionality, the average uh, direction of, mo of motion as well. So what we'll do is we'll take a Taylor expansion, and for those of you who have derived conservation equations in in engineering classes before, this should be fairly familiar to you. Um, we're going to relate this uh, energy density field U. Uh, to itself or to, to these uh, its location uh, through a, a Taylor expansion and we'll say that uh, that the internal energy density at Z plus lambda equals the internal energy density at Z minus lambda multiplied by the gradient the Z gradient of U multiplied by its uh, its the separation between those two locations that we had earlier so it's uh, it, and then we'll truncate all of the other all the other terms. So now we're going to do a little bit of geometry. We, we've defined this polar angle theta and we'll say that that uh, this lambda z has to equal the actual mean free path multiplied by cosine theta of that of that polar angle um, and same with with the z component of velocity and so we go ahead and make those substitutions we, we put those things back into our expression for the heat flux and we get this uh, final expression on this page where I'm now relating this z component of the heat flux to um, the overall velocity of the carriers, the overall mean free path, and this z component or this uh, z derivative of the energy density field. And then the prefactor of cosine, uh, cosine squared, right, you might say, well, there could be all kinds of different thetas and you'd be right. This is for one particular theta and we're going to have to now average over uh, the, the spatial coordinates and, and dimensions. So we're going to have to average over a hemisphere of solid angle 2 pi. We talked a little bit about solid angles when we dealt with with um, the uh, with Planck's law when we derived that last week. Um, and so we're going to take an average of the heat flux so that's an average of, of all of these carriers moving in, in uh, the various directions. 
the uh, a solid angle of 2 pi if i wanted to integrate over that solid angle with a function that itself depends on the angle i have to i have to do some take some extra steps here and so that's what we're showing in this step here and the next slide will give you at least a geometric interpretation of of the solid angle um, and so we have this azimuthal angle we're going to assume here that that we have azimuthal symmetry to the problem, which you don't always have, by the way. But we'll assume that most of the things that we do in this class will need to assume that we have that, that symmetry. We've already done it for k-space, if you remember how we derived, for example, uh, the, uh, the Debye-specific uh, heat. So looking at this a little bit more, what we find is that this average heat flux can be expressed as a product when I just evaluate the integral that's shown there as a product of the velocity, the mean free path, and this z gradient of the energy density. And then pre, pre multiplied by a factor of one third that comes from an evaluation of those integrals. And the minus sign is there to, to denote that the heat will flow in the opposite direction of the, the internal energy gradient. So if we integrate this with the, the solid angle, or if we look at the solid angle integration problem, and this is mainly here for your reference, um, the, solid, the concept of solid angles is one that, that uh, often confuses students, and um, so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but I'll just say this, that a solid angle by definition is, a, 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 or a differential solid angle is a differential area normal to some central point, and so that's the dA sub n here, divided by the distance between that central point and the, the uh, normal area squared. So that's the r squared term. And if you just do the, the geometry on this problem, and, and you can actually derive it from all of the factors that are given here, you will find that this differential solid angle is indeed the, the uh, sine theta d theta d phi. So if we, if we continue on, recalling that we had a, uh, an expression for that average heat flux that, that was a product of velocity, mean free path, and the z gradient of the internal energy, we, would, we now see that we can, what we'd really like to do uh, in terms of uh, the thermal property that we're after, which is still thermal conductivity, we haven't mentioned it since the beginning, uh, is to, to have a temperature gradient, it, to express the problem in terms of a temperature gradient instead of a Z gradient. And so we, we proceed to use the chain rule, simple chain rule, where that Z gradient of U is the product of the temperature gradient of U multiplied by the actual temperature derivative with respect to Z. And you know, if, I hope that at least some of you you know, your, your interest is peaked a little bit because we've seen the derivative of u with respect to temperature before. We called that the specific heat earlier. And, uh, and so now we can see that when we make this substitution, this heat flux or this average heat flux in the z direction is, again, a collection of, of terms, the specific heat, because this partial derivative of, of u, of specific energy density, with respect to temperature, that is by definition the specific heat um, multiplied by the, the carrier velocity multiplied by mean free path. And again, you can think of the mean free path as a single number. And even though the mean free path will change, can, can be modified by uh, the carrier energy or direction or, or the temperature of the system, uh, we're just going to think of that as a constant for now. And later we'll get into all the different permutations it might take. But that collection of terms, if we go back to something called Fourier's law, Fourier's law says that the heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradient, uh, and the constant of proportionality is the thermal conductivity. And again, the minus sign out in front just says that heat flows downhill. Heat flows from high temperature to low temperature. Um, and so this collection of terms, one-third CV times V times mean free path is the thermal conductivity. 
And you see that here. This is a, a very important result. It's one that you'll often see uh, cited in, in even contemporary research papers because it's, it's a very simple uh, expression uh, and it wa it's one that captures much of the physics. I think we, we have to recognize here that the group velocity uh, could, could, be, could vary with um, direction, it could vary with frequency for phonons, it could vary with energy for electrons, but, we've, but those, are, those are details that, that can come into a more advanced analysis. Um, the mean free path, the same thing. So this is, but this is still a wonderful result because it's so simple and so many things tend to follow these dependencies of this, the thermal conductivity is proportional to specific heat and group velocity and uh, the scattering length. So lastly, we get to the thermal conductivity and, and could sort of understand, to understand what it means. Um, we will say that this is a, a universal approximation for all carriers, that would be phonons, photons, and electrons. Um, we could define a thermal conductivity for photons if we had a highly scattering medium, for example. Um, and it, it, does, uh, it does rely on knowledge of, uh, of a mater the material properties, the heat capacity, the velocity, mean free path. And for phonons, what we're going to do is we'll use, for velocity, the, the velocity that we'll use is the group velocity because that's the velocity with which energy transport occurs. And the mean free path will be the product of the group velocity and the scattering time. And the scattering time is the inverse of the scattering rate, uh, which is something you'll also often hear. So that's all for today. Um, I will, I'll come back for one more lecture this week uh, where we'll wrap things up and summarize what we've done this week. Thank you.